the series premiere of Androids and Aliens. A young woman lies on a bed with her legs up in stirrups, a sheet on top of her covered in blood. She screams at her, What's wrong? Is it breathing? Let me see my child! An intergalactic cage is shattered. She continues walking right past the guards as well until she finally reaches the surface and walks right out of the most inescapable prison in the universe. Old loves are lost. He turns to look at her. I love you, she says, and her seat crashes through the floor, taking her with it. No! Psychic powers are unleashed. The doctor falls to her knees, reeling in pain, grasping at the sides of her skull to stem the pain she cannot reach, trickles of blood leaking out of her ears. And a strange alien race is discovered. And we see what looks like a mouse person. (laughs) (laughs) A new adventure begins. A couple of things are going to happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. What's going on, everyone? My name is Troy Lavalley, and I want to welcome you to Episode 1 of Androids and Aliens, the first officially licensed Starfinder actual play podcast of the Dead Sun's Adventure Path. Now, if none of that makes sense to you, just 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 stick with me, and I promise I'll stop talking nerd speak in just a moment. In addition to being your host and game master of the show you're about to listen to, I'm also the CEO of the Glass Cannon Network. A network, by the way, that only exists because of the unbelievable community of listeners we've built up over the past three years since we launched our first podcast. We are beyond fortunate to have taken this hobby of ours and turned it into an actual business where the possibility of being able to do this for a living is not that far out of reach, which is insane, frankly. And that is all thanks to the support of our amazing fan base. So if you like what you hear in the episodes to come, you are in for a real treat because you're not only going to have a fun new show to listen to every week, you're about to join a rabid nation of some of the best people you'll ever come in contact with. A little bit about myself. I'm an actor, writer, and comedian living here in New York City. We're all based out of New York, actually. I grew up in Massachusetts, go Sox, but I've lived here for going on 18 years. And just like I planned it when I moved here to get my MFA in acting, I'm now a full-time podcaster playing make-believe with people in their late 30s and early 40s. If you're not familiar with tabletop role-playing games or actual play podcasts or what the hell Starfinder is, I'll cut right to the chase. In our case, six complete losers sit around a table and play a game called Starfinder. Before Starfinder, there was Pathfinder, and before Pathfinder, there was Dungeons & Dragons. I'm sure you've heard of one of those. The overall plot of the story we're about to tell is actually pre-written in a six-book adventure path called Dead Sons. Now, as the Game Master, or GM, I'm the only one who knows what the story is. The other people at the table all create characters, and I then take those characters through the story, changing it along the way based on all the decisions that they make and each of their individual backstories. We use dice rolls and a lot of super nerdy math to determine the success and failure of anything they choose to do. So, let's say one of them wants to shoot a laser at an alien across the room and hit him right in the kneecap. There are mechanics for that. What if you want to use guile or deceit to lie your way through a conversation with like a underworld mob boss because you need to gain some information? Well, guess what? There are mechanics for that too. So basically what we do, it's part collaborative storytelling and improv and part advanced quantum physics. See? A little something for everyone. Just a little history on us. In June of 2015, we started our first show, The Glass Cannon Podcast, which is another actual play of the Pathfinder Giant Slayer Adventure Path, where Pathfinder takes place in a medieval, like, sword and sorcery type setting, Starfinder takes place in, you guessed it, the distant future in space. What started out as just one podcast has now turned into a network of content, and you are getting in on the ground floor at a very exciting time for us, as we continue to shirk all of our life and family responsibilities to deliver hours of laughter and tears every week to people just like you. Now, before we get to the show, I urge you to do a couple of things. One, if you like what you hear, rate and review us, especially on iTunes. It's ridiculous. In fact, it's absurd how much even one review can help get our show in front of more and more people. Also, please check out our website, glasscannonpodcast.com, to listen to our other podcasts and to stay up to date on our live shows and appearances where we just hang out to drink beers and play games with our listeners. Now, you might see 150-plus episodes of our other show, the GCP, and get intimidated, but I beg of you, start at episode one. Don't worry, you'll catch up 
and you'll be glad you did. Lastly, tell your friends. Whether you're a gamer who can tell your table buddies about us at your next session, or your Johnny or Jane cubicle with fellow co-workers that need to kill some time during the workday, tell your friends. Hell, you know what? Tell your enemies. We'll take anyone we can get. But hey, you didn't come here to listen to some jerk do a 40-minute intro, did you? No, you came here to listen to the new show. Or you just accidentally clicked on it thinking it was a podcast about uh, astronomy or uh, finding maps to celebrities' homes. Either way, thank you for finding us, and please enjoy Episode 1 of Androids and Aliens. The time has come. The prep is over. The cast is set. The maps are out. The dice are out of their box. It is time to start recording a brand new podcast. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first episode of Androids and Aliens. Yeah! I am excited. I am too. Man, we have been talking about this for months. Months. Literally months. We announced this. Years. Years. (laughs) At least 16 years. Eons. (laughs) Epochs. Joe was in pre-K yeah. when we first started when talking about this. I first had the this. seedling of this idea. I said, one of these days, someone's going to write a game called Starfinder, yeah. and I'm going to podcast it. His and no one's going to stop me. His first words. Is a That's little... my dream, Mom. Starfinder. <laughs> and here we are. We announced this in August of 2017, and now, if you're listening to this, it is April of 2018, and this is episode one. I mentioned a lot in the intro about what this is all about, so I'm not going to waste time reiterating it. What I'm going to do is introduce you to the lovely people in this room. Now, a lot of you may already know Only the lovely people? What about me? And Skid. (laughs) Thank you. And Skid. You know, I'm actually going to start with Mr. Skidmar. Everybody give a big round of applause for Skidmar. Oh, thank you. Skid, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, I, my name is Skidmar. I'm, I'm a, f- a fixture, I think, at this point, you could say, on the Glass Cannon podcast. Um, I am an old-school uh, geek. Gronyard, as they say. I'm, I've been a gamer since, uh, since third grade. And uh, I've been doing this my entire life, basically. And I love it, and I'm so excited to be... I love sci-fi. I love sci-fi gaming since... Going back to Star Frontiers and Traveler back in the day, and I am super, super excited. Where are you from, Skin? From Denver originally. Denver, and how long have you been in New York? Uh, I've been in New York for uh, I've been in New York for uh, oh God, seventeen years. Seventeen years. Seventeen years. <sighs> well, that's Skid, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that about sums it up. I that about sums that up skid. That's me. You're going to get to know and love Skid very, very soon if you don't already. Next up is my friend and yours. Mr. Grant Berger. Grant, everyone. I'm go, clapping go, go, for go, go, myself. I'm <laughs> clapping for myself. Does that Grant, it's radio. You didn't have to tell them that. <laughs> Grant, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? What do you do? Why are you here? I am from Dallas, Texas, currently residing in Queens, New York. I am a video producer for nonprofits, a dutiful husband, and a consummate nerd. And uh, I am just... Uh, are you reading from a script? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I've uh, been also a fixture on the Glass Cannon podcast for some time. But for those of you not listening, I'm uh, just thrilled to be taking this space venture with all of you. Oh, yeah. cool. oh. well, welcome to the show. Uh, next up is the infamous. I can't believe we even got him in the room. Mr. Matthew Capitacata. Hey. <laughs> Matthew, tell yeah. us a little bit about yourself and why did you grace us with your presence today <laughs> to record this first episode? I thought we wouldn't see you until episode six or seven at least. Uh, I'll start with the harder question first. The reason I'm here is blackmail. Okay. <laughs> uh, didn't, couldn't, we didn't really have a choice, really, uh, after I saw what you had. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm Matthew Capitacaza. I'm a playwright and a fiction writer, uh, and I have also been on the Glass Cannon podcast for some time oh, now. Oh, I've heard of it. Uh, you've heard of it. It's <laughs> yes. good. Uh, I've heard, too, uh, once or twice. It is quite the coincidence that we're all on the same other podcast. <laughs> yeah. It feels Shocking. weird now. I feel like I should have looked this up beforehand and yeah, yeah. mixed yeah. it up a little more. Maybe we should have mixed it it's up. It's too late now. <laughs> yeah, that's me. You say you're a playwright. Um, what are some of the plays you've written? Can you give us some names? <laughs> any some, titles? Any we might titles know? that maybe our, our listening audience might be familiar with your work? Um, if you don't tell me, we'll just make some up. 
I've written such plays as uh, I have a play called From Etch the Man Eater. I have a play Classic. called The City in the City in the City. Of course. Uh, a play called You Remind Me of You. Pulitzer Prize winner. No. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. Uh, among others. Grammy Award winner. Yeah, I won a Grammy. Gram- <laughs> I won a Grammy. Spoken word. Spoken word. Yeah. Special Grammy. He is the only um, player at the table with an, uh, with an EGOT. <laughs> Emotionally granted opportunistic, opportunistic <laughs> turncoat. Yes. <laughs> Matthew Capitacasas. Uh next up, take a couple steps down from Matthew. Is your buddy and mine, Mr. Joe O'Brien. Hey! hey what's you going son on? Son of a gun. Where are you from? Why are you here? I wish you didn't come. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> what I really welcome. appreciate it. Like most people from Philadelphia, I am much maligned uh, outside of my city. Uh, I am from Philadelphia, and I am uh, I'm a big geek like Skid. I love this kind of stuff. Also a fixture on the Glass Cannon podcast. Hey! Uh, I yeah. knew I recognized him. <laughs> was there right from the beginning. <laughs> oh, my God. Couldn't place him. <laughs> I got I, I to gotta confess, I, uh, I love science fiction, but I have never played science fiction role-playing of any kind. Oh, you're in for treats. And I was, uh, <laughs> I was you know, worried and concerned about this. I didn't think that it was... I, I like to play fantasy setting RPGs, and so I, I've never really uh, done this before. I played D&D 2nd Edition when I was a kid, and, and that's my, been my only real experience with RPGs is that sort of setting, that sort of style. But as over the months we have read and prepared for this, by the way, that should not uh, indicate that I am ready for this. No, no, no. Uh, But as part of that preparation, I have grown to be really, really excited about this setting and this rule system and the way everything works. And I'm really excited to see how it all plays out. And I, I honestly, I don't know very much at all about what everybody is bringing to the table in terms of characters. And for me, that's my favorite part of starting a new story, a new campaign, is getting together with your friends and seeing what characters they've generated out of nothing. Oh, yeah. And then starting them on a journey together and working together to make this story. I take great pains to make sure you don't share information with each other beforehand because part of the joy, especially with early sessions, is discovering each other while also discovering a little bit about yourself. (laughs) Oh, boy. It's already started. (laughs) Oh, boy. And... Last, but by no means least. But smallest. But smallest. <laughs> well, yeah. Back to back with Matthew real quick. <laughs> <laughs> nope, second smallest. <laughs> we have added a new member to our show. The Glass Cannon Podcast is just myself, Skid, Matthew, Grant, and Joe. And for the first time ever, with our second weekly show, we have added a new player to our game. So please welcome Eleanor DiLorenzo. Yay! Yay! Yes. Yay. Eleanor, where are you from? What do you do? Why did you make this decision <laughs> to hang out with us and commit to a six-year game? <laughs> did I mention Wait. it takes six years to finish this? Oh, Jesus. No. Uh, <laughs> she looks genuinely afraid. She really did look, look startled by that information. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, uh, I guess, um, <laughs> I guess I'll be here for a while. She slowly out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I am Ellie, and I'm from Sweden. So I'm oh. the I am the uh, extraterrestrial, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is androids and aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm an actor in New York. I've been here for five years. I've uh, been a nerd my entire life, like everyone else in this room. And um, yeah, this is going to be super exciting. Uh, I'm similar to Joe. I th- these past few months have been a lot of uh, researching Starfinder and uh, figuring out what's going on with the uh, with the uh, the world we're exploring. Together, so it's. I'm, but I'm super excited because I uh, I'm super into sci-fi, uh, especially lately. It's there's a lot of great sci-fi shows happening right now. I I believe. Agreed. It's a hot time for the old sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. good stuff. So we got thought, a whole network on the TV now. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they spell it real clever. Yeah, like to throw you off. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I never knew. Oh. <laughs> oh, sci- science ah. fiction. Oh, now I see. Oh, oh now I get it. it. <laughs> clever, clever girl. Well, you know, we have all been doing our research. Uh, we've all been preparing <laughs> as best we can. But if you've listened to us before uh, on the Glass Cannon, you know that uh, for everything that we know really well, 
there is a bunch of stuff that we have no idea about and we constantly forget about. And I think Starfinder will be no different. So our plan is it's to our really, really... It's really yeah. our trademark. If you is, think we made a lot of mistakes before, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in for a real treat Just now. you wait. Just you wait. That was a game we had been playing for four solid years <laughs> yeah. before we started episode one. We still don't know anything. This is, the, this is when we played for four solid practice sets. <laughs> and I will say, to our credit, Joe only gets minorly defensive when we mess something up. <laughs> right. Yeah. As you'll notice in about 15 minutes. Um, but, you know, our, our goal is really to learn with you guys. When we make mistakes, call us out. Call us out on social media. Write on our website like, oh, you effed up this rule. You screwed this up. And we will learn and hopefully uh, fix it for the next couple episodes until we inevitably forget it again and make the same <laughs> mistake. But here we are. Beginnings are tough. It's always hard to just jump right in. It's like an awkward situation. You've got to talk about your characters and all that stuff. But really, as I've learned from doing this now for hundreds of episodes, you just got to jump right in. I sent all of you an email this morning, uh, a personal email, that I'm going to read to our listeners. Ooh. It says, a message appeared on your personal comm unit a few days ago. Congratulations on your interest in joining the Starfinder Society. It is my distinct pleasure to help facilitate your membership into the society, if you so choose. I have made arrangements for the shuttle Okimoro to make a stop at your location on the way to Absalom Station. You will be arriving at Dock 94. Once you get in, I will help you and your fellow applicants get settled, then I'll show you around the station. Just look for a dwarf with a badge bearing the Starfinder Society insignia. That's me. Signed, Duravor Creel. Can you spell that for us? No, I will not. <laughs> D-U-R-A-V-O-R-K-R-E-E-L. <laughs> That's the last name. It's so funny to see you all take copious notes because like, in 10 episodes, you'll be like, okay, great. But now you guys yeah. are <laughs> I know we're all so nervous. I appreciate it. I appreciate the enthusiasm. Um, so that's the note you got. So over the past few hours or so, this ship, the Yokimoro, has been picking you up. So imagine just the utter blankness of space. Complete silence. Stars. No ships, no planets. And then all of a sudden, a shuttle rolls in. That was my mouth, by the way, not a professional sound effect. Wow. That's shocking. That was real. Wow. Is this said in the Jetsons, Troy? I'll do it again. <laughs> oh, man. Pulls into frame. I've had eight months to practice. We zoom in through the window of the ship to see dozens of people, all manner of races, Anxiously awaiting their journey to Absalom Station. Maybe they live there and they're returning. Maybe they're visiting there for the first time. Probably not. It's kind of an important place. But either way, they're going there for specific reasons. And the five of you in particular are going there for very specific reasons. Imagine a camera like coming up the aisle of the ship. I picture it like a really fancy Greyhound bus. You know, like <laughs> two rows of seat on either side. A futuristic like an airplane, bus. maybe like an airplane. No, no, no. <laughs> right on bus. <laughs> Definitely not an airplane. Like a, kind of flying. Like, granted, you're being. I mean, kid, you're being ridiculous. <laughs> Imagine a flying bus. <laughs> <laughs> an air, wait, is it like an air bus? Maybe? <laughs> no, 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 no. Just a bus. And the camera's just zooming up these rows of seats. And we close in on an older woman. Eleanor, what does this character look like? She looks like um, she's very well put together. Gray hair, gray short hair, blue eyes. Stocky built. And um, she's wearing a, a, very, a very nice but common flight suit currently. And she, is, she has no particular... Emotion in her face. About how old is she? 57. 57. Mm. What is this woman's name? Her name is McCullen Donovan. McCullen Donovan. 
Mac to her friends. Yes. <laughs> Mac. Mac. <laughs> <laughs> and if there was an actress that played her, who would that actress be? I've cast her as Judy Dench. Oh. Dame. Yes. The dame Judy. herself. Dame. Yes. That is quite a get for our show. Yeah. Man. Right off the bat. Our right. first dame. A-lister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And our last. <laughs> the word of our show gets <laughs> Might as get a sir as, in there. As soon as the cease and desist <laughs> <it> arrives. <laughs> what is this androids and aliens? <laughs> so she's sitting there with no discernible expression on her face. And... This camera zooms in on her eyes. Imagine as if you're watching this like a film. You see, yet again, the outside of a spaceship in orbit. Stars stretching in every direction as far as the eye can see, but no planets, and all you hear is nothingness. The vacuum of space. A ship comes into view, and we close in on it up to a window in the rear. The second we pass through the window into the interior of the ship, the silence is immediately broken by a frantic scene. A young woman lies on a bed with her legs up in stirrups, a sheet on top of her covered in blood. There is a droid next to her that is only torso, arms, and head, trying its best to tend to her, but she's screaming in pain for her mother to help. A younger McCullen Donovan, a younger Mac, mm. rushes into the room with a panicked look on her face. She looks down to her left, and there's a man dead on the floor of the ship, his arm missing up to the elbow. Mac is clearly out of her league here, but doesn't want to let her daughter know because now she has to deliver this baby. After an intense and long labor, the child finally arrives. The relief in Mac's eyes, though, only lasts a moment because something seems very wrong and the daughter can immediately read it on her mother's face. She screams at her, What's wrong? Is it breathing? Let me see my child! Mac rushes out of the room with the child into another room. She sets it down and begins just washing the child off. As the afterbirth falls away, Mac sees that the infant is covered in scales along with other anomalies like a tail and bumps along the spine. Mac just stares in shock at this disfigured infant as a scan runs over its body. <laughs> the onboard AI says something that she doesn't even hear as a hypodermic needle appears out of a column next to the scanner. The baby clearly needs whatever serum is in this needle to survive. Mac hovers over the infant, needle in hand, and just watches in horror for what seems like an eternity before dropping the needle to the floor and walking out of the room to the sounds of her daughter's muffled screams echoing down the hall. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. Blackout. Oh, <laughs> damn. We continue looking at these people on the shuttle Okimoro, and we see what looks like a mouse person. <laughs> In Starfinder parlance, it would be a Yusoki. Skid, what does this mouse person look like? <laughs> uh, he looks, I, we prefer the term rat man <laughs> to a uh, mouse person. Uh, he's uh, three foot six. Um, if you ever, you ever seen Secret the Nim? Oh my god! Oh, oh, my god. oh yeah, it's one great. My right? All time favorites. Yeah, it looks like one of them. <laughs> I thought you were going to say nothing like that. I have it. I have the picture. <laughs> the picture on my character sheet is actually. <laughs> I'll have to post it, uh, but because uh, I googled, because he's a he's a medical doctor, so I, I googled mouse doctor. <laughs> Like on the internet, and it's this cute little looks like a little sheep, but he's like holding a little medical bag. And he's like he's adorable. He doesn't look like that. I, I got to figure out what he actually it's looks ridiculous. like. Ridiculous, but, uh, but yeah. And uh, what is this character's name? Uh, his name is Doctor Kundatu Friss. Doctor Kundatu Friss. Yeah. And 
now this is a mouse person, obviously, uh, a rat man. <laughs> obviously. Like obviously. Soaky. <laughs> did, you, did you cast an actor to play him, CGI, or just the voice? Well, I, the thing is, uh, well, he has kind of a distinctive accent that I took from um, the, the Belter patois on The Expanse, the oh, TV show yes. The Expanse. Mm. Uh, and the person who does it best on that show is Mr. Jared Harris. So it's it's if if he's he's doing the motion capture and the uh, voice work. <laughs> wow, for yeah, that is quite a get. Yeah, and I didn't know until recently the interesting piece of trivia you have upon uh, on Mr. Jared Harris. Yes, he is from England. Very interesting. <laughs> oh no, no, I know. What you mean. No, I say, all right. Next on the show, no. <laughs> are you saying because he's Richard Harris's son? Yeah, I yes, he's Richard that. Harris's son. Yeah. You didn't know that? No, I had no idea. I didn't know that. And I, mean. I saw Richard Harris live on stage in a production of Camelot when I was twelve years old, and I never forgot it. Mm. It was amazing. Well, look at that. Yeah. So here, this little mouse person, Rat Man, <laughs> Yosoki, <laughs> is sitting there. What's the look on his face? Is he just like lost in thought? Uh, he looks nervous. Um, I think he's always kind of twitching, but he's definitely like kind of s- sussing out, uh, eyeing eyeing up. What is it, what's the term I'm trying to think of? Uh, looking looking at uh, <laughs> everyone <Regarding>? else. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> guardedly looking at everyone else on the space bus. <laughs> so, <laughs> sizing them up. That's what sizing I was sizing them up. Sizing, sizing them, them up. up. <laughs> yes. As he's God. sizing up everyone else on the space bus, <laughs> nervously twitching, we zoom in on his eyes. Mm. And as his pupils are going back and forth, you hear the sounds of monotonous sloshing back and forth. Lights come up on a floor covered in blood. You hear the sound of water splashing, followed by a mop dropping into frame over the blood. Dr. Kundatu Friss is mopping up after treating a difficult patient. He picks up a chunk of perforated liver from a surgical tray and dumps it into a protein recycler. As he's working, he hears the staticky buzz of the front door open alert. Wiping his hands on his apron, he steps away from the operating room into the foyer. A man is standing there, wearing expensive but gaudy clothes and jewelry. Oh, I know, say, Friss. Nice doctor, Friss. Really? That's not what I heard, Mochuba. In fact, if it was Dr. Friss, I wouldn't be here, would I? Mr. Hush is very disappointed in you. So much time and money invested in his little protege, only for you to throw it all away. After much deliberation, Mr. Hush has decided he wishes to be reimbursed for everything. After uh, interests and penalties, he estimates the debt to be uh, in the range of one million credits. Friss looks around him at his dingy backwater clinic, and it's obvious that he has no way to pay that amount. He just stares at the man as if to say, I don't have it. Uh, this is a real shame, Chuba. Lucky for you, I'm here today, all friendly-like. You know what? I'll go ahead and tell the mister you can't pay. But then tomorrow, it's thing one and thing two standing here instead. Friss shudders, as does anyone at the merest mention of Hush's bodyguards, a brutally ferocious pair of Viscarian twin sisters. <laughs> no, wait. His voice trembles, as does his hands, as he pulls a ring from around his neck. Oh, find a way. I always have. Give this to the mister. I place on my service. And a down payment. He lays the ring down on the counter between them. A sick smile spreads across the other man's face. Looking at the ring, he's like, Ah, I remember you. I always knew I'd see you again. With a smirk, he reaches out his hand to take it. Quick as a cobra, Friss whips out a hypodermic needle and plunges it into the man's grasping hand. 
The thug jerks backwards in surprise and pain. He starts to lunge at the Yosoki, but his legs give way as he stumbles backwards. He collapses, motionless on the floor, conscious, but unable to move a muscle. Friss walks with a deliberate pace around the counter towards the limp figure. Uh, Don't worry, Basa. It's only a paralytic agent. He grabs the man by the ankles and begins to drag him across the floor. Only lasts about 30, 45 minutes at most. He pulls him behind the counter and towards the operating room. Unfortunately for you, you will not live quite that long. Friss then proceeds to vivisect the man, tossing the severed chunks into the same protein recycler as he goes. (laughs) When the job is done, he pours kerosene all over the clinic, takes his go bag and his med kit, sets fire to the place, and scurries off into the night. Doctor Kuta to freeze! Don't you fuck Dr. with Dota freeze more tuba? <laughs> oh man, now this is something that you don't get in fantasy role playing. It's enough mentions of protein recycling. <laughs> That's right. This is our first ever uh, on either podcast. I am digging this. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Gotta set the mood. Yeah, man. <laughs> Plus, this is an Atkins-approved podcast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no carbohydrate recyclers to speak of. We continue up the aisle, and now we see a hulking figure. It's a female vesk. A female is marked by a more colorful facial palette. Am I correct? I believe you are. Matthew, since you were the first one to speak up... <laughs> Please describe the physical appearance of your character. <laughs> <laughs> she is six six feet and change, tall, muscled, covered in scales. They're a reptilian race. Mm. And she's sitting cross-legged on her... Like she's managed to fold her huge frame into a cross-legged position on the chair. Her eyes are closed. Her palms are resting face up on her knees. And she appears to be meditating. Meditating. This is a vesk. If you're new to Starfinder, the Vescar, how would you best explain them? They're just reptile people, right? They're a warlike race. Warlike race. And they're, they were at war with the Pact Worlds until they relatively recently right. signed the Pact. And the Pact Worlds refer to, like, basically society at large. If you've read any uh, science fiction book, it's like the Commonwealth. The Federation. The Federation. Yeah. It's like yeah. everyone that's agreed to a certain treaty. Well, for a while, the Vesk planet was against it. But now they're a part of the Pact. Tenuous, though it may be. And what's the character's name? Her name is Krez Kaletha. Ooh. Ooh. The I like un- it. The unnamed. Ooh. Ooh. A little nickname in there, maybe? Krezka, for short. To her friends. <laughs> Who are those? Mac. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Say high five. <laughs> All right. With that, names. She doesn't open her eyes. She just offers a high five. Nickname, <laughs> buddies. <laughs> Judy Dench, the no-look high five. <laughs> Easy to picture. Now, this is a t- another tough one to cast because we're going to have to use some CGI, obviously. The mocap CGI. We have, the, we have it in the budget. Um, <laughs> so who did we cast in this? Uh, Priyanka Chopra. Oh, you son of a gun. Who's that? Uh, she is on Quantico, which probably would be if you're most familiar with her. Uh, most familiar with. Um, oh, wow. yes. she is okay. beautiful. She is a. She is way wow. too attractive <laughs> to hang out with. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. um, she's an she's an Indian actress. Yes, mm. but she has recently jumped the pond. Priyanka Chopra to join our podcast. To join our podcast. <laughs> well, really, to record to like suit up in those little motion capture sensors and do that. I haven't looked at her IMDb profile, but I'm going to say it's the best career move she's ever made. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a zoom in on Krez Kaletha, the unnamed. Her eyes for the moment are closed as she's lost in meditation, this hulking figure. So everything begins in darkness. You hear the sound of whizzing and whirring electronics, busily working to control whatever machine is making these noises. Fluorescent lights blink on, one at a time, and you see a female vesk in manacles, alone in a small elevator. She's looking around her as her eyes adjust to the light and all of the obvious security measures keeping her in check as she travels deeper and deeper into the heart of the planet. 
Suddenly, the elevator stops. Her manacles dissolve as if they were only a hologram, and the floor drops out, dumping her in a small cylindrical chamber with no doors save for the one she just fell through, which immediately closes. Lights back up. Maybe some time has passed, and she's screaming and raging, pounding with all of her might on the walls, just yelling for someone to give her more information. Time passes again. Now she's lying on the floor, defeated, hoarse from yelling. All of a sudden, a small robotic arm comes out of the ceiling and deposits like a food cube in front of Kreska. She picks it up and fires it back up the arm right as it disappears through the hole. Time continues to pass, and Kreska looks haggard. She has something in her hand, though. Looks like maybe silverware or something else left over from one of the meals that have been deposited to her over the years. But she's waiting for something, just staring at the ceiling. The robot arm appears. Kreska takes out her makeshift tool, leaps at the arm, grabs it, and extracts it from the ceiling. She feels victorious for a moment, shaking the robotic arm at the cameras to celebrate her victory. Seconds later, the hole opens up again. Another identical arm comes out and dumps a food cube at her feet. (laughs) She weeps. Weeks, months, years pass. And her rage, anger, depression, and defeat have all given way to an overwhelming sense of calm. We now see her sitting in the chamber, not unlike how she was sitting on the Okumoro, meditating. Again, the hole in the ceiling opens, just as it has three times a day for the past 16 years. The arm comes out, drops another food cube into the room. Kreska does not flinch during all of this, deep in her meditation. The arm disappears, and Kreska slowly opens her eyes to look down at the food cube that is now floating inches off the ground. Hmm. She closes her eyes again and breathes deeply as the food cube thrusts itself up and into her mouth. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Cool. A new day. Kreska calmly sits on the floor of the chamber, maybe a wry smile in the corner of her mouth. The door above her opens, but no arm descends this time. Instead, a voice simply says, You are free to go. She waits for a moment, thinking this this has got to be a trick. But nothing happens. So she climbs up and out. Slowly, she walks past all of the other maximum security cells, past the murderers, the rapists, the perpetrators of genocide, all of them suffering from the various emotional states that used to plague her before she found peace. She continues walking right past the guards as well until she finally reaches the surface and walks right out of the most inescapable prison in the universe. (laughs) (laughs) Kreska! (laughs) Wow! Awesome! Awesome. A guitar riff comes in. (laughs) We will be arriving at Dock 94 shortly. Voice comes over the intercom. All of you sitting there. Amongst all the other people on this shuttle, just anxiously awaiting this next phase of your life. Maybe you're going to join the Starfinder Society, or maybe you're here for other reasons altogether. We see a young girl sitting. How is she sitting, Grant? Well, if you've ever taken public transit late at night, and um, when the train's not quite full, and you see a woman by herself, she's kind of guarded. She has her posture closed off to the rest of the room. And she has a bit of a shawl around her head. It's kind of in a hoodie situation because she's trying to hide her otherworldly beauty and nature. And by otherworldly, I mean Castrovellian. She is a Lashunta. Oh. Oh. She is about six foot two. She is very slender and impossibly beautiful. She has purple hair, long, Mm. past shoulder length. Mm. 
green eyes, mm. silvery white. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like the room, Trent? <laughs> I, I need a cough button. <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> green eyes, mm. silvery white skin. <laughs> Stop. Stop it. <laughs> right. I'm just going right. to say that. <laughs> All right, Captain Kirk, just settle down. <laughs> silvery white skin that shines a little bit uh, and black spots trailing from her eyes down the side of her face and she gives off if you were to look at her long enough and you would look she is captivating in the traditional sense of the word she seizes your attention from you she gives you an unnerving feeling as you stare at her like something's unsettled with her you mentioned she's a Lashunta talk to me about a Lashunta what a, what a, what's a characteristic of a Lashunta Lashuntas have all of them, regardless of their subspecies, which is something we'll get into at a later date, I'm sure, mm. uh, antennae growing out of their head. Ah. They are psychically gifted. Mm. And although they are able to get along with just about every race within Starfinder, with the exception of the Shireen, who they have a poor history with. Mm. The bug people. The bug people. Um, they are often mistrusted because... Everyone is wondering if they're delving into their thoughts as they are around them. What is this young lady's name? Her name is Meishan Vanya. Oh, I like that. <laughs> and who is the actress that you cast? Who did we get? We will put this up on the site. I'm sure we'll put everyone's up on the site. No, she is yours. played by <laughs> Rila Fukushima. Oh, my goodness. She is great. And she is. She plays Yukio in The Wolverine. She's been a Red Priestess in Game of Thrones. She's been in Ghost in the Shell. A lot of smaller roles. Um, her primary language is Japanese, so it's difficult for her to get cast sometimes. We can get her a translator for the show. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so is she sitting there giving off this... Uh, sort of intimidating air to others that may glance her way, we go into her thoughts, into her memories, deep into her memories. You see dawn slowly creeping up over the surface of a planet, waking the verdant jungles and their inhabitants. The light takes its time spilling over untouched wilderness only to eventually crawl thousands of meters up the rocky spires of the mountains. Waterfalls dot the landscape as excavators leave their own mark as well, digging for precious ores. A Lashunta adolescent. A child not yet old enough to choose the path of Damaya or Karasha, male or female, opens their eyes. Gray, cold steel encircles the child, shackles, binding limbs. This is the 180th time the child has opened their eyes in this place. Heavy, handleless doors light up and slide open, just as the child knew they would, knowledge gained both by repetition and Lashuntan psychic premonitions. A smartly dressed and impeccably groomed female human doctor enters the room. Good morning, Meishan. I do hope that you'll be more willing to cooperate today. Meishan just spits at the feet of the doctor. Well, that's no way to begin such an important day. Why, it's your birthday, my child. <laughs> Demaya Lashunta orderlies dressed in clinically starched white scrubs enter the room as if on cue, with detached precision, the orderlies remove Meishan from her bed and shackled the child to a gurney for transport. Flailing and kicking does Meishan no good. She's tried that before. So in a moment of desperation, Meishan stares with intent at the doctor as her antennae writhe in concentration. The doctor falls to her knees, reeling in pain, grasping at the sides of her skull to stem the pain she cannot reach, trickles of blood leaking out of her ears. A muscled fist whips through the air and Meishan falls. As she's fading out of consciousness, she hears the doctor use a word that would come to hold great meaning for her from this day forward, and at the time, she didn't know what it meant. Dampeners. 
Hmm. Michonne opens her eyes. She is no longer a child now, no longer innocent. She tries but fails to stifle a nervous laugh. Why does she always retreat to the memory of that day? The memory of that birthday? She looks up and yet again is startled by unfamiliar eyes in front of her own. And she is greeted with a strange patois. Oh, take it easy, Motuma. You had a difficult day. For the first time in a long time, she is under the care of a new physician, Dr. Kundatu Friss. Ha! Ha! You sneaky bastards! <laughs> <laughs> now, I was able to remove your dampeners, but it's a bit of a trick to get rid of your tracker. You see, it's embedded in your brain stem. A new day has begun. Mei Shun thanks the doctor, gathers her things, walks outside and smiles for the first time in a long time. Mmm. Mmm. Mm. I was doing a call back to when I was doing the mm. <laughs> glad, it, glad it killed. Really? Yeah. It was for a very different reason. Mm. Mm. <laughs> May Shun Vanya. Ooh. Oh, wow. Intense. I love that idea of like before you decide if you take the path to male or female. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. And they are, there is dimorphism, but it's not sexually determined dimorphism in the Lishinta people. They can be clear. They can uh, procreate with either uh, subspecies, one-on-one, one or the other. They appear to our human eyes to be female oftentimes, but it's not the same type of gender. And what happened to this poor young girl? Well, now she's free. Or is she? Mm-hmm. And then we continue going up at the aisle and in the back, the last row of the flying greyhound machine <laughs> <laughs> the magical flying greyhound machine <laughs> is an android <laughs> androids are essentially sexless but this one appears to be male joe what does this android look like he is uh, he appears mostly human uh darkish Uh, Kind of an olive hue to his skin. Um, But half of his face is a slightly different color than the other half. Um, Just slightly. Just like a slightly different shade. And there's a line that goes down the middle of his face that would mark him as an android immediately on sight. It's sort of a bluish green line, almost like a circuit beneath the skin that you can see sort of glowing. Uh, And it ends just at the bottom of his chin. If you could see around to the backside of his head, you would see that below his neck, where his neck meets his back, his skin is exposed. There is no actual skin there. And there's a metallic skeleton, and you can see some of the spine as it disappears beneath a radiation suit that he's wearing. And you can see the lights blinking on that as well. On his neck, just above where the radiation suit is, you see just a little bit of the top of... uh, what appears to be more circuits under the skin in a patch uh, that, you know, it would sort of almost look like a neck tattoo, kind of, but it's actually moving underneath the surface of, uh, of his skin. And he has nicely combed, short brown hair parted neatly to the side. Uh, and he is played by Riz Ahmed. Oh, yeah. I love him. <laughs> so hot right now. <laughs> he's so hot right now. Uh, and and what, he's sitting. Yeah. Think like uh, Forrest Gump, almost. Sitting with his palms on his knees, completely motionless, looking at the floor, and there's nothing r- readable on, on his face. What is this character's name? His name, his technical name, is Distribution Android X-19. His friends called him Dax. Dax. I like that. Mac and Dax. Now, if you're not familiar with androids... (laughs) Mac and Dax. (laughs) Let's keep it to three letters. (laughs) If our listening audience isn't familiar with androids, it's like the little uh, girl robot in Small Wonder. (laughs) Vicky, 
Did you watch Vicky from Yeah, yeah. Yep. It is. Yep. That's yeah. what it is. All right. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Episode one. <laughs> Get him out. Get him out now. I just, I just like that you wanted to imagine a scenario where someone who clicked on the podcast, Androids and Aliens, had no idea what an Android was. <laughs> that was part of the joke. Didn't really land. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. I edit these. Oh, no. We're, it's working for, I'm picturing him in the outfit now, and now I'm laughing internally. <laughs> so, that's, so that's good. We got to keep this conversation going, though, so Troy can't edit it out. Yeah, that's exactly. The point. <laughs> <laughs> We no clean breaks. No we just laughs. I can use those laughs any way I want. <laughs> Troy, you are so handsome. <laughs> GM. <laughs> <laughs> I should also say, though, like, for, for androids, it's important to know that they, they are about 150 years ago in, in the lore of this world. They earned their freedom behind the, the rising of a rebellion led by one particular android Mm -hmm. whose name escapes me at the moment but for 150 years they have had citizenship and they are free citizens uh of the colonies though they used to be built and owned they are now free citizens the abolitionist android you speak of uh was named steve (laughs) <laughs> that was it. It's canon. That was it. I, I think it was it's Sisyphus Six. Yes, and he has or a name. Surfius. Uh, Surfius. Sisyphus Steve. Sisyphus Steve. It's the same thing. <laughs> uh, so last, and by all means least, we zoom in on this android as we get closer to his face. To his get, eyes are yellow, by the his, way. As we get closer to his face and his yellow eyes, you can hear the circuitry moving as the camera gets close to that. Doop, doop, the sound that we hear right now from... The beautiful sirenscape, uh, dead sunset that we're using. <laughs> I love it. Yes. I love it. Dax gently breaks wind. <laughs> and is glad he's sitting at the back of the bus. <laughs> he's s- hoping the Lashunta didn't hear it. <laughs> the Lashunta just came out of the bathroom and gave a dirty look in Dax's direction. <laughs> we go into those piercing yellow eyes, and the yellow eyes just turn into smoke. The smoke starts to clear, and you see that it's that it was filling the air of a space hull. Bodies litter the floor, surrounded by rough-looking dudes walking about, armed with various laser pistols. Two men, a dwarf and an android, are kneeling on the floor, back-to-back back with each other, each with guns pointed at their skulls. A gruff voice rings out, Get rid of them. Distribution Android X-19 winces as the sound of a laser pistol goes off and he feels the body of the dwarf behind him fall limp to the floor. The pistol charges up again to fire when all of a sudden he hears with perfect clarity the timbre of a voice in the back of the room. He can't see where it's coming from, but it pierces all the way up to him. Wait, I'll take care of this one. A moment later, Dax hears... A very distinct sound, one that he'll remember for a long time, feels a razor-sharp pain and blacks out. A high-pitched whine pierces his ears as he wakes up to sounds of shouts and screaming. He feels the sensation that he's falling. His eyes open groggily as he looks down to see that he's strapped into a pilot seat of a starship that is in free fall. Instinctively, he reaches out to his left for a control that isn't where it's supposed to be. He looks at the control panel in confusion in front of him. This isn't his mining ship. Before he has a moment to assess where the hell he is, he hears a voice yell out from behind him, Fly! He looks out the cockpit window to see the ground rising up to meet the starship. Without thinking, his subroutines kick in, and he starts flipping switches and pulling up on various throttles. The nose of the ship starts to rise. More voices ring out around him, but he doesn't hear them. He hasn't taken his eyes off of the computers. He guns the engines. The ship levels out in the heartbeat before meeting her own shadow. He sees structures in the distance and begins looking for a landing zone. But all of a sudden, an alarm blares to life in the cockpit. His radar shows him what the problem is. Multiple hostiles, all on his six. This doesn't make any sense. Then shots begin peppering the hull and missing to every side of the ship. Pew, pew, pew. After dodging and flying at speeds he's never even attempted, the structures on the horizon come into view. But what at first looked like a bustling metropolis is just the remnants of a city. 
Husks of skyscrapers line the horizon, while below, nature reclaims streets and apartment complexes with shrubs growing up from cracks in the pavement. He maneuvers the craft around, through, between, under the hollowed-out monoliths, trying to lose the enemies behind him in the high-rises. Then there's a moment of calm. He doesn't see any blips appear on the radar. But he couldn't have lost them already. In that silence, he hears another voice. A female voice beside him, to his right. Now, she says. He turns to look at her, and it's as if his data is corrupted, so he only sees a body with a blurred-out face, like a computer glitch. Maybe it's a Lashunta woman? I love you, she says. And her seat crashes through the floor, taking her with it. (laughs) No! Dax wakes up again, but this time he's in a hospital room. Walls painted eggshell white and dozens of monitors surrounding him. X-19, can you hear me? A human voice asks. I can. He seems to be fully awake now. The man says to two women and another man in the room. X-19... Please tell us exactly what happened out there with regards to shipment 9845B. We were boarded by pirates. There were two, at least, possibly four. The co-pilot was killed. I was targeted, but a voice said, wait. Then I was falling. A woman, perhaps a scream, could have been the hull. The wind blowing through the hull, I'm sorry, it is. My data appears corrupted. There was a city, though. A dead one. Hollowed out buildings, perhaps a nuclear explosion. More details are hard to grasp at the moment. So strange, I've never heard a case of one of the X-series fabricating lies to cover up insubordination. (laughs) Would he have done it to protect his crew, perhaps? Well, they still haven't resurfaced. That doesn't seem likely. Well, we will have to let the director know immediately, for sure, but no matter. Uh, X-19, there seems to be some malfunctioning, as you say, with your ability to access your own memory units... Shall I run a diagnostic? No, no, that won't be necessary. Um, (laughs) You see, there were no pirates or women or hollowed-out buildings, as you say. And as far as we know, your co-pilot and the rest of your crew are fine. I'm sorry, sir. With all respect, that is incorrect. There were pirates. Look here, X-19. He waves his hand in front of Dax, and a holoscreen appears in front of the hospital bed. Minority Report style. Yeah. And Dax sees himself asleep in the cockpit of his mining ship. It's docked outside of some seedy establishment somewhere in the diaspora. And a group of probably teenage thugs exit through the main hatch, absconding with a large crate from Dax's ship. Pirates... Dax, <laughs> well, perhaps you've been nodding off to too many holofilms. <laughs> now, as for your crew, they will be punished as well when they resurface. In the meantime... We'll punished? I do not understand. It is not your concern. We will get you street ready and on your way. Of course, having violated the terms of your employment contract, you are personally responsible for the financial loss to astral extractions. You have... Uh, Two weeks to pay, or you will be reconfigured. Dax barely hears that veiled threat, though. Because in that moment, all he can think about is the woman with the blurred-out face saying, I love you, (laughs) and disappearing. Dax. (laughs) Dax. (laughs) 
awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we will be arriving at Dock 94 in mere moments. If you look out to the right, you will see the Scatterfoud <laughs> Nebula. <laughs> to the right, you will see the Armada. <laughs> Oftentimes, mining ships will just dock out here. It's become a little community all its own. <laughs> You've been reading the lore guide. <laughs> I've had a lot of time. <laughs> Please put your trays in their upright position. <laughs> and did someone break wind in the back of the <laughs> No matter. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, shuttle, like, t- it starts shaking a little bit as it's going through uh, the atmosphere and you're changing atmospheres, and eventually it docks. <laughs> so, you know that you have arrived at Absalom Station. The Okamoro lands in Docking Bay 94, one of scores of docking bays occupying the star-like arms that encircle Absalom Station's equator. The final docking procedures take a few minutes, at which point the cabin attendant welcomes the shuttle's passengers to Absalom Station. Welcome to Absalom Station. (laughs) (laughs) And you guys descend from the Okamoro onto the floor of Docking Bay 95. The brightly lit docks of awesome. Absalom Station. <laughs> oh, it's happening! <laughs> so the brightly lit docks of Absalom Station are abuzz with activity as travelers bustle by. Remember, you weren't the only ones on this shuttle. People are either preparing to board or disembarking from other starships on this dock, bound to or from any dozens of worlds out there, pack worlds or maybe other. You see brash and swaggering star pilots, scurrying Yosoki mechanics, Hmm. and expectant colonists all mingling with enigmatic Kasatha mystics. Kasatha, (laughs) we'll learn about them later. Long heads and forearms is all you need to know. (laughs) Hard-faced asteroid miners, imposing Vesk mercenaries, and more, creating a microcosm of the abundance and variety of life in the pack worlds. New arrivals meet friends, loved ones, or business contacts. It's like limo drivers with a sign that says, Jones. Hi, Jones. (laughs) Oh, right this way, sir. (laughs) Right this way, Mr. Skywalker. (laughs) (laughs) We'll take you to your next wing. Uh, And they're just all whisked away into the humming activity of daily life on this vast space station. Beyond them, you guys see ground crews tending to the dock ships and <laughs> working on them. Uh, and dock workers in... It's a Formula F1 race. <laughs> <just going through. laughs> it speeds up. It's pit crews. They start high-fiving. We did it. <laughs> oh, Jeff Gordon, come back. <laughs> There's also like dock workers in mechanized cargo lifters uh, oh, loading yeah. and unloading freight and baggage. Like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can run that loader. (laughs) Bay 12, please. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. We we did Aliens references on our fantasy I know. You think you're in for for a lot more, I think, in this one. Future trivia questions. Uh, As opposed to the smell inside the Okamura, which had this very, uh, although fake but nice, welcoming smell... Um, right what when does you, that smell like? That new bus smell. Yeah, that new bus about? smell. Like, like Greyhound smell? Like Greyhound smell, yes. Uh, we all know. You get, <laughs> you get off the Okamoro and there's this sharp tang of like ozone hanging in the air. A byproduct of the electrical discharges from the dock ships. But underneath, the whole station itself has this sort of like used aroma. You know what I mean? Mm. Underneath you, the docking bay's deck plates thrum beneath your feet. Though whether it's from the passage of innumerable feet going back and forth or the vibrations of the station's power conduits and air recycling systems, it's impossible to say. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's the air recycling. It is the greatest mystery of this adventure. Oh, man. (laughs) And now you have your mission. (laughs) Wow, I thought it would be more kind of involved. Two dead (laughs) sons. (laughs) <laughs> oh boy <laughs> Everybody roll a perception check Oh first roll 
first oh. roll. This is going to say a lot it's about this say adventure. Everything you need. To I know. see double digits on Grant's die. Shocking. Not a surprise. <laughs> Natural twenty. Oh. Matthew, Matt, 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 Matthew. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. <laughs> Skid, what'd you get, buddy? 13. 13 for Skid. 13. Matthew got the Natty Twanzo. 27. Okay, Grant? 13 for Mission. Oh, 13 for Mission. And Dax? Six. Six. <laughs> <laughs> That's about yep. right. That's about what? right. <laughs> and what about Mac? 21. Oh, oh wow. Return wow. of the Mac. <laughs> return of the Mac. <laughs> Um, okay. A couple of things are going to happen. <laughs> oh, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when things happen. <laughs> All of you, even Dax, who I don't know what you were busy focusing DC on. DC 5. DC 5. <laughs> yeah. You see a dwarf <laughs> oh. on the other side of the docking bay. He's rather tall and lanky for a dwarf, though. He's got a bristly iron gray beard and deep set eyes beneath bushy eyebrows. With his patched and stained coveralls, he just looks like another dock worker, but a badge bearing the symbol of the Starfinder Society stands out on his chest, just like he said it would. <laughs> you see Duravor Creel, played by Robert Duvall. Oh, oh. <laughs> speaking of pit crews, another wow. A- another A lister. Yeah. He's like, he's holding his personal computer and he's looking it up to like scan the crowd. He sees you guys and raises a hand, uh, like a gesture and a greeting, a friendly smile, like, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> However, while Dax and Mayshun and Dr. Friss only really see Doravor Creel waving to them, as does Kreska and Mac, Kreska and Mac, your eyes start to wander to the rest of the dock. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on, but you both see what appears to be two very distinct groups of people on the fringes of the docking bay furtively taking up defense positions among stacks of cargo crates and machinery. Dervor Creel raises his hands up to wave to you, and it's just like slow motion as all of a sudden the air is filled with laser blasts. Oh, jeez. What? Bystanders scream and flee in terror, <laughs> diving for cover or milling about frantically. <laughs> it was just one laser blast. <laughs> Everyone calm down. Creel himself freezes, paralyzed with fear, and then falls to the floor with a sound and does not move. Oh, shit. And we will see you next week. Oh, yeah! Yeah! Oh, shit! Yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, it's space! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Woo! It's space. No one can hear you. Awesome! <laughs> Androids and Aliens is a Glass Cannon Network production and is an officially licensed partner of Paizo Incorporated. Dead Sons is copyright 2017. Dead Sons and the Starfinder Adventure Path are trademarks of Paizo. All Starfinder images are property of Paizo and are used with permission.